Regardless of what programming language you start with, if you're working with an object-oriented language, one of the first things that you start encountering are collections. And there are many different types of collections, so even if you're in your algorithms and data structures class, you're hearing about stacks, queues, arrays, lists, link lists, you have all these different options and a dictionary or a hash map is one that comes up as well. So this video is just going to be a very preliminary look at dictionaries in C sharp. So if you're a beginner, stay tuned because we're going to walk through some of the basic operations of dictionaries and then a couple of nuances with them as well that you should be able to understand early in your programming journey. We'll save the more advanced stuff like concurrent dictionaries and other things for a later time. So we're not going to look at the performance or anything fancy for now. We're just going to look at the basic operations so that you can understand better how to use them in some of your programs. All right, we'll keep it short and let's jump right into Visual Studio and get going. All right, so I'm here in Visual Studio and on my screen, I just have a new project that I created and we can see that from lines eight to 10, I have what's called a record and it's of a person type that I've created. So there's a name and an age. And if you're not familiar with records, it's just a really basic class that we have. And these are constructor arguments that also get changed into properties. And the other part that I have in my program right now is just that I have an array of people. So it's a new person array. And then I have three people defined in here or three persons, however you'd like to go and say that. So I just have John, whose age is 25, Joe, whose age is 26, and Jimmy, whose age is 25. Now, this video is on dictionaries, but this is an array of people, and I just wanted to start with that so that we could compare the array in the dictionary. A lot of the time when we're dealing with things like dictionaries, we want to be organizing things by a particular key and then a value. So dictionaries are key value stores. And the key in a dictionary is supposed to be unique. And then the value is something that corresponds to that key. So in this example, if we wanted to look up the ages for each individual person, what we could do is have a dictionary where the key is the name and then the value is actually the age. So instead of an array of them where we would have to go one at a time looking for each name to go pull the age, we could actually go look it up very quickly by looking at the particular name and at that position where the name is, we pull the age. One way that we could do that is actually the code that I have now from line eight to 13. And this is where we actually declare a dictionary. So we have two type parameters because a dictionary in C sharp is what's called a generic. So the first type parameter is a string and that's going to be our key. And that's because we want the key to be the name. And then we have an integer as the second type parameter for the value, and that's because it's the age. And if you look at the example above in the array, you can see that we have a string and integer, string and integer, and string and integer. So that's just to explain how we arrive at this. And then we declare the new dictionary. I'm just using a short form syntax here because as you can see, this part on the left hand side is actually pretty verbose. I'm just trying to save some space on the screen. This is one type of dictionary initializer that we have access to, and I'll show you a couple of variations. But in this case, we have a key where John is the name, and then we have the age 25 being assigned to that key. And that corresponds like in the array up above on line three for this entry here. The next two for Joe and Jimmy, as we see here, correspond to the ones we see on line four and five in the array above. I've added on screen now another variation of a dictionary initializer, and this is extremely similar, but instead of having the syntax where we're assigning with the equal side, a value to a particular key, we're just actually defining the key value pairs themselves inside of the dictionary. Both of these initializers that I'm showing on screen will result in the exact same behavior. For no good reason, my personal preference is to use this one above. I really like the look of just having the equal sign and having fewer curly braces, but to each their own, these will do the exact same thing. Okay, instead, if we didn't want to go defining all of the people right when we're creating the dictionary, we could go ahead and add these things to the dictionary after it's created. The syntax for being able to do that is what I have on screen right now. So from lines nine to 11, as you can see, we're just adding entries into the dictionary. If you see on line eight, we have the semicolon right at the end. So this part actually makes the new dictionary. And then these three lines add the items. And if you recall what we just had in the video right before this, these three things correspond to how we were initializing the dictionary before. 
and they correspond to what we would see in this array otherwise. In this case, we're using the add method on the dictionary, and one of the characteristics of the add method is that if the item already exists, this will throw an exception for us. This can be a good and a bad thing depending on your program and the types of checks you're doing, because a dictionary by definition is not supposed to be able to have duplicate keys inside of it. So if you accidentally had a duplicate key added like this, even if you had a different age assigned to that key, this particular line here on line 12 will actually throw an exception because once we've executed line 11 before it, we already have this key inside of the dictionary. So this will throw a duplicate key exception. If we wanted to check if Jimmy was already inside of this dictionary, we could write code that looks like this. On line 12, now I have this if statement that's saying people by age contains key, and then we use Jimmy passed in. And this exclamation mark in front actually inverts the rest of this. So this actually says, if not, people by age contains key Jimmy, or otherwise said, if this dictionary does not contain the key Jimmy, then we can go ahead and add it. So if this code were to execute, line 11 would run, and then when line 12 runs, it would actually say, hey, Jimmy's already inside of this dictionary when we use contains key, therefore we won't go run this. And if we commented out line 11 like this, then this code would run on line 12 and say, people by age does not contain the key Jimmy, therefore we will come into this if statement and add Jimmy. An alternative way that we could accomplish this if we just wanted to be able to overwrite what's already in the dictionary is by using the indexer. On screen now from lines 9 to 11, I've actually changed the code to instead use the indexer instead of the add method. For these three items, when we assign them like this, this will have the exact same behavior as when we were adding them before because there are no duplicate keys. If you think about the other example that we had prior to this, when we were trying to add a duplicate with Jimmy as the key, in this particular case, line 12 will not throw an exception but it'll instead just overwrite the value 123 for the key Jimmy. That means if you're trying to update a dictionary, you don't actually have to check if the item exists in the dictionary if your goal is just to overwrite whatever's there already. So we've talked a little bit about writing values to the dictionary, but if we wanted to get the values back out of the dictionary, we could use the indexer as well. On lines 13 through 15, I've added three indexers that are actually getting the age for the different keys that we're passing in. So John age would end up being assigned to 25 because when it asks the dictionary if John is inside there and pulls the value back out, we'll get 25. And the same thing for the other keys, but for the other names. On line 16, if we had James that we were trying to get out of the dictionary, this line 16 would throw an exception when we try to use the indexer with James, and that's because there is no key in the dictionary with this name. Using what we learned before, we could use contains key first to see if James is in the dictionary before we pull it out. So we could try writing an if statement to help us. So on line 16, I've added in contains key and we're looking for James. And if it is in fact inside the dictionary, we can pull it out. This is a pretty common type of operation that we might do on a dictionary where we want to be safe and check for a key before we actually go pull the value out. And because of that, there's actually a better operation that we can use that combines this into one. On line 20, I've actually introduced another if statement instead that uses try get value instead of contains key. And try get value will actually return true if the key exists, so in this case, James. And if it does exist, it will actually output James age, which is the variable we defined, using this out parameter. If you're not familiar with out parameters, this is essentially allowing us to have almost the equivalent to two return values on a method. And in later versions of .NET, we actually have some other varieties of ways to do this without the out parameter. But one of the common naming conventions and patterns that we have in .NET is this try and then some method that we want to be able to try. And that pattern is generally a Boolean return value in some out parameter. So in this particular case, if we were on line 20, because James is not added to the dictionary above here, this if statement would not actually get entered for the body of it, and that's because James, when we try to get value, would not be found as one of the keys. If instead this was Joe, when we go to run line 20, we do know that Joe was inside of the dictionary, and that means that Joe age 2, and I've just made another variable declaration because we already have Joe age up top here, but this Joe age 2 would then get assigned the value of Joe's age. And then we would be able to go into this body of the if statement and do something with Joe age 2. And because that mostly wraps up the very basic operations of a dictionary, I wanted to explain one more slightly advanced topic because I think that this will come up 
early in your usage of dictionaries, and I thought it would be interesting to cover. If you're learning about dictionaries or hash maps in your data structures and algorithms classes, what you're going to be noticing is that dictionaries are using hashes to be able to store and look things up. So what ends up happening if a hash code for a particular item ends up colliding? Well, I've written the answer right here. And essentially, you're allowed to have a duplicate hash code, but that's going to end up reducing the performance of a dictionary, which is giving us generally this ability to go look up a particular item based on its hash code extremely fast, unlike a list where we might have to go look through each element to go find that item. But when the hash code is duplicated, we end up having a bucket at that particular location inside of the dictionary, and the performance ends up falling back to essentially a list. So when you have a lot of hash code collisions, you end up reducing the performance a great deal, again, back to a list. And that means that you're going to have to be iterating internally over the different items in the bucket to pull out what you need. So I wanted to illustrate this with a quick example, because this is actually something that comes up where people implement this get hash code method incorrectly. If you're familiar with record types, then you'll know that they have get hash code and equality operators built in for you already out of the box to help a great deal. But if you're not familiar, you can watch my other video on that to understand that a little bit more clearly when you compare a record and a class. Now, before we had access to records, a lot of the time people were implementing their own equality checks and get hash code so that they could compare more complex objects that weren't just a single value. So for the example of a person, for a person to be equal, we might say that the name has to be equal and the age has to be equal as well. Now, in this particular case, I'm showing a really bad example, so please don't go use this in your code. The whole point is to illustrate what happens when we do things wrong. So I've actually done a really bad job here on line 23 of making a terrible hash code, and we're just using the age. It's not even factoring in the other property of the person, which is the name. So that will mean that just when we have duplicate ages, these hash codes are going to collide. And if you're thinking about people in general, the likelihood that you're dealing with people of the same age is actually pretty high. For example, statistically, a large majority of the population is below the age 100, and that means that you're going to have billions of people that would fall into that range of below 100 for their age. And that means the likelihood of a hash code collision is really high. But just a reminder, when the hash code is the same, it doesn't mean that the item is going to end up replacing the existing item if we were to assign a new one. It just means that the bucket internally inside of the dictionary is going to behave more like a list than it would a dictionary for the fast lookup times. If we go back to the example we had at the top, this dictionary actually wasn't using the person record at all. We had that defined for the array, and I just wanted to be able to show you that we could split apart the properties to make a dictionary representing a similar thing. If instead we made the person a key, this is where we might find some more interesting behavior with these hash codes colliding. So one thing that often happens when we're working with arrays or lists and then trying to organize things to go look up by a particular property, in this case by name or age, this is where we might use something like an array or a list and then use some link or some other operation to convert that into a dictionary. So let's quickly look at that and then see what ends up happening when our hash codes collide. All right, so on my screen right now, I'm actually using what's called link to be able to turn this people array into a dictionary where the key is the person and the value is an integer representing the age of that person. Now, this is a little bit of a contrived example. I don't exactly know why you might want to have the entire person as the key for the dictionary, but let's go ahead and see what happens. Just to prove what we have inside of the dictionary when we're done, I'm just going to iterate through it and print out all of the items in the dictionary. We're using a for each loop, we can use people by age that we're iterating over, and then we're going to have a value item for each key value pair inside of there. And then we're just using console.writeLine to print that out. And just a quick reminder, we do have two duplicate ages for John and Jimmy, both at 25. And if we scroll back down and we look at the get hash code implementation, we do actually have a really poor hash code implementation here just using the age. So John and Jimmy should have hash code collisions, but we still should see both of them show up in the dictionary. Okay, so when I run the application, we can see that we have John, Joe, and Jimmy printed out as the people. This is actually coming from the get hash code call. Again, I wouldn't ever put a console.write line inside of a get hash code method, but you can see that the hash code is 25 for John, and then Joe is 26, and Jimmy is also 25 for the hash code. 
And this is because I implemented a really bad hash code method. And then if we actually go look at the last three lines that are printed out, this is from the for each loop. And we can in fact see that we have a key and a value where the person is the key and the value is the age. And we still have John and Jimmy included in here even though their hash codes were the same. All right, so those are the basics of working with dictionaries inside of C-sharp. So we looked at being able to initialize dictionaries, add things, check if things are there, and then we looked at updating versus adding as well. So if you're just interested in overwriting what's already there, you don't necessarily have to check contains key before doing that. The last little part that I showed you was something a little bit more advanced, but I thought that might be interesting for you to see because if you end up having duplicate entries that are based on the hash code, you can see what's going to actually happen inside of your dictionary. So remember, if the key is the exact same, this is where you're gonna have that overwriting behavior. But if the hash code is the same, you're still gonna have both items show up in the dictionary. So it's not gonna overwrite what's there, but the performance will be reduced. We didn't do a benchmark or anything like that, but if you had a ton of items and you were looking at the performance with a bad hash code implementation, then you would start to see that performance degradation where the dictionary starts behaving like a list. So keep that in mind for your data structures and algorithms classes and when you're building software, because if you're implementing get hash code and you're doing it wrong, you're gonna be paying the penalty in performance. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time.